life. This is the thing that we all know and love, but why are we even doing it? And what's it going to look like in, in five to 10 years? Uh, so I thought this would be a, a great audience for, uh, uh, for this kind of uh, ramble. Um, and in order to answer this question, we're going to ask ourselves, well, what does it look like now? What are the kinds of practices that we use today, the kinds of techniques that we use today? And if we keep going with these kinds of techniques, uh, where is that going to lead us in the near future? And I'm also going to be talking about the technological trends which are likely to intersect with neuro-AI because we don't live in a void. There's technological developments which I think are directly relevant uh, to the story of neuro-AI. So uh, I'm going to give all the TLDR and, and, uh, and spoil uh, the entire talk in this, uh, this first slide. Uh, I think that we're mostly building neuro-AI models now because we're curious. We're curious about the brain. The brain is awesome. It contains all of our experiences and everything I'll ever live uh, lives in there. I want to figure out how it works. Uh, but as a consequence, uh, we're also building these interesting engineering artifacts, which are these in silico brain models. And I argue that these models are actually useful for something. They're not just uh, curiosities, uh, but rather uh, they can be useful for control. And I argue that control is useful for uh, delivering therapies through the senses, which are designed through optimization. And we'll unpack that a little bit because I know it's a little bit out there. Um, so I want to uh, I want to tell you that uh, our field might very soon intersect the real world because there might be actual applications of this you know, thing that we're doing right now, which is neuro AI. And uh, that's exciting, I think, for you who are students in, the, uh, in this new field. So it's important to think about what that will look like in five to 10 years. And uh, I want to leave you with this, uh, this impression, which is that the best way to predict the future is just to build it. And you are going to be the ones that uh, are going to build this future. All right, so where I'm coming from here, uh, as Pia mentioned, I've been writing a lot on xcore.net, which is my blog for many, many years now, for 14 years. Uh, there's 230 blog posts on there, but there's, uh, I think, like six or seven from the past two years, which are particularly relevant uh, to, this, uh, to this problem of, uh, of neuro AI. And uh, uh, like uh, Pia mentioned, I come from this mixed background of academia and industry, and I've also done research at the intersection of neuro AI and, uh, and artificial intelligence. And so I hope that I have a kind of a different perspective than a pure academic perspective or a pure industrial perspective uh, that you might find interesting. So uh, let's get first things first, which is what is neuro AI anyways? Like, what are we even talking about? Uh, so I asked the Oracle, uh, as one does, because uh, as you can see, the stock was made like pretty much this week. Uh, so uh, I asked the chat GPT, of course, to give a succinct definition of neuro AI. And I think it hits like uh, a couple of good notes. Uh, it says that neuro AI is the intersection of neuro and AI, you know, two points right there. Uh, it involves the use of AI techniques and algorithms to understand the function of the brain uh, and the development of neuro-inspired AI that mimic the function of the brain. So a lot of stars right there. However, uh, it's neuro to AI route is actually the AI to neuro route and vice versa. So, you know, good news. Uh, you're not out of a job yet. Uh, I think it will take uh, at least a couple of years for the AI to, to, to take over. Uh, in all seriousness, I think that we all have like kind of different ideas about uh, what it means to, to build this new field of neuro AI. So I made a map because I love maps. Um, so. I, I, I uh, just to, to give a, a little bit of a nomenclature and a little bit of, of uh, the territory, if you will. So on the right hand side, we have that, uh, you know, some people's home turf is neuro. They're neuroscientists. They care. Uh, <laughs> sorry, yeah, I'm going to do like a lot of pointy stuff. Uh, so they're neuroscientists. Uh, they really care about the brain and neurons and all that good stuff. So they're on the right. Some people really care about artificial intelligence. They're like, I don't like that uh, life is full of tedium and I want to build robots to do all of my dishwashing and, and whatever things that are not fun to do in my life. And that's the people that are on the, uh, the left. But there's another axis, which I think is equally important. Uh, at the bottom, there's uh, curiosity driven research. So we're mostly interested in these things because we think they're cool. And so we should study them because they're intrinsically interesting. I think that if you, if you talk to a random person on the street and you're like, I do brain research, they'll say, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> so, uh, so, that's, uh, so, so that's that location. And at the top we have the drive is application. So we think that these things that we're building are potentially useful to you know, reduce the tedium of, uh, of human life or maybe to 
enhance the way uh, enhance our health, uh, for instance. Um, so like there's all these motivations which are floating around. And I think that there's uh, two in particular which are really well trodden. Uh, one is AI as models of the brain. So I'll give more examples later, but the classic example is modeling the ventral stream of the visual cortex with a convolutional neural network. And so that is a very mature field, and uh, we'll get into more detail about this later. Uh, there's another uh, very well-trodden area, which is mining neuro to find new AI. So the argument usually goes here that the only intelligence system that we know of is the human brain. So if we want to create intelligent artificial systems, we should get inspired by how the brain works. And so we have mined a lot of facts about how brains actually work from, uh, from humans, from perceptrons to CNNs to reinforcement learning and um, attention. Uh, and so that's another like very well-trodden area. And between that and that, uh, there are a bunch of other little boxes, uh, which are, you know, perhaps like less popular, but people have been like filling out this whole field uh, that, uh, that at the intersection of neuro and AI. Uh, but what I want to point out is that, gosh, this, this box right here in the top right, it sure is empty. It sure is barren. And so uh, it, we you could argue that building biomarkers, for instance, is kind of neuro AI. I, you know, I, I would argue that it's neuro AI adjacent and that it uses AI tools to understand the brain. But it's, it's certainly something that people can, uh, can argue. But I want to fill this box. I want to tell you, like, actually, like this box, this idea that we can do neuro and that we can do applications with respect to neuro, there's stuff in there. And the two things that I'm thinking of specifically is to generate treatments, treatments which are delivered to the senses and um, to use AI models of the brain, uh, to, of, the, of the sensory uh, periphery uh, to tune brain computer interfaces. And uh, right now these fields are very much uh, at the start, but pretty soon I, I think I'm gonna argue in this talk that uh, they will be ready for prime time uh, over the next few years. Uh, so let's, uh, so to be clear here, uh, what I'm saying is that let's keep doing this, this box right here that everybody knows and loves, let's keep doing it. And then as these things come online and we create better and better models, uh, I, I think that these models are going to be useful for the boxes I've done, right? Okay, I, I hope that there's not going to be much more pointing uh, I throughout do. this I time. love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep going. All right, so uh, let's see a, a classic example of this interaction between AI and neuro. This example is, is so well trodden that uh, I'm sure many of you could give could, could give it in your sleep uh, uh, with uh, with a blindfold. Uh, Ubel, uh, David Ubel and Torsten Weasel found cells in the uh, primary visual cortex of cats that are selective for bars of for, for bars of light, right? And uh, so they call these cells the simple cells. And then they found another category of neurons which are selective for orientation, regardless of the exact polarity of the stimulus that created it, whether it's, it's white to black or black to white. And they call these the complex cells. Uh, and these uh, cells are, um, are, are interesting because they represent two different operations. One is a selectivity operation over particular inputs. And the second one is a kind of pooling operation over uh, certain invariance classes. And so Fukushima in 1980 uh, used this idea to create what's called a neocognitron, which you could call the first convolutional neural net, and was not just a little bit inspired by this idea, but a lot of it inspired, as you can see here, uh, essentially made an in silico version of uh, what was known then of, the, of, of a transition from the retina to the LGN to primary visual cortex. Uh, and the classifications from simple to complex to hypercomplex uh, cells that were known then. Uh, and if you look at the diagrams in that paper, that doesn't look very different than the kinds of diagrams that you'll look in a paper on a ResNet from, you know, three or four years ago. Um, and in fact, uh, this, uh, this research, this uh, neocognitron was then, then inspired uh, Jan LeCun to make Lynette, uh, which is the same model class that was eventually uh, used by Alex Krzyzewski and Jeff Hinton and all in 2012 to solve ImageNet, or 
well, not quite solve ImageNet, but uh, to perform better than had uh, ever been uh, performed uh, before on the, uh, the ImageNet competition, and then eventually solve this problem of object recognition. So now we have CNNs, which are inspired by the brain and can solve something that the brain can solve. I mean, first of all, that's amazing. Uh, but second of all, like how much like the brain are these things actually? And uh, so in uh, 2014, uh, Jim DiCarlo, Dan Yamans, uh, Nico Kriosgorte, and Kelly Gazivi uh, worked on this exact question. And we're first able to compare real brains to fake brains, <laughs> which are the, uh, these convolutional neural networks. So the way you do this is uh, you take a battery of stimuli at, that you, uh, so you pass uh, a bunch of stimuli through um, a artificial neural network. You measure the intermediate activity of this, uh, this neural network to these uh, stimuli, and then you can compare uh, against a uh, real brain. And the way that you compare it is to, you know, potentially linear regression or representation similarity analysis. But I'm not really going to go into detail about that because Elisabeth Dupré tomorrow is going to do precisely that. So stay tuned. All right. Um, but uh, nevertheless, they were able to find that actually these things are pretty similar to, uh, to the brain in a few different ways. Uh, first of all, out. Uh, first of all, they were able to account for a lot of the variance in infrotemporal cortex. The models that were the best at doing categorization were the ones that were the best at predicting IT. Well, that's weird. Um, the layer assignments were kind of recapitulate the hierarchy of the visual cortex. So the lower layers uh, of the artificial neural net correspond to the lower layers of the brain. You know, V1, and the highest level, the layers of the artificial neural net correspond to the highest layers of the brain, infrotemporal cortex. And uh, finally, the information geometry can be made to match uh, using a little bit of, uh, of reweighting. So all of these, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you follow this idea of duck typing, do you know about duck typing? You know, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's a duck. So if it walks like a brain and it talks like a brain, maybe it's actually a little brain. Um, and so I think that got people really excited that like, hey, we're creating these things which kind of look like, like little sensory systems. And, um, and from these uh, kind of low resolution approximations, these you know, drawings of ducks, if you will, uh, we're getting models that are now uh, much uh, higher resolution and are good approximations for the brain. Uh, so that means they account for uh, a good chunk of variance. Uh, they account for more subtle metrics, which we'll get into. Uh, they're more biologically plausible, and they have higher coverage uh, to other sensory areas and also the hippocampus. Uh, so let's give a couple of examples here. Um, so one thing that, uh, that you might be aware of uh, is that one way in which artificial neural networks are different than, um, than real brains is that real brains are not particularly sensitive to adversarial stimuli. So this is a panda. Uh, and if we add a little bit of noise uh, to it, we get the image on the right. And this image will be classified with very high confidence as a gibbon in this case. And you can do this with any pair of, uh, of classes. So it's, it is very strange that artificial neural networks have this quirk and that it seems that humans don't have it. So what if we try to fix that? Uh, if we try to fix that problem, will that give us a, a better model of, uh, of the brain? Well, it turns out that there's a good way of, of fixing that. When you train uh, a convolutional neural network to solve a task like, <laughs> like me in the, no? Okay, so I'm gonna keep on this in this corner just for a little bit because uh, <laughs> I wanna make sure that my walks last at least like a minute. Um, okay, so what we can do is when we train uh, a neural network to solve this image classification task, we can swap the real images with adversarial versions of the same stimuli. And uh, it creates like a little epsilon ball around each, uh, each stimulus. And so if we do this uh, dynamically, we get adversarially robust uh, neural networks and they turn out uh, to be pretty interesting. Uh, so what does an adversarially robust neural network uh, look like? So here's a, a CrossFit, a, a visual transformer that is attacked uh, so that each of the images on the right uh, sorry, each of the images at the bottom are actually classified as a goldfish. They don't look very goldfishy to me, uh, but, but you know, maybe you have uh, more of a crossbit type visual system so you can see it. Uh, but at the bottom, we've trained it with adversarial training. And in this case, to get the model to classify things as a goldfish, 
uh, we have to use attack vectors, which I don't know, seem kind of goldfishy to me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, especially if you look at this little frog right here, I don't know, the frog, the second image uh, at, at the bottom looks like like a little hybrid between a frog and, uh, and uh, a goldfish. If I looked at it in the corner of my eye, maybe I would say, oh yeah, this kind of looks like a goldfish. What's interesting is if you train a, a network adversarially uh, to be robust, uh, it turns out that it's also better at explaining areas of the visual cortex. Uh, it was until recently, you know, one of the top five models that would explain V4, as well as explain infrotemporal cortex when it's done against a, a battery of stimuli and a battery of different models. Uh, this is uh, BrainScore, which is an online leaderboard where people can come in and battle different kinds of, uh, of neural networks trying to explain different areas of the brain. Um, I was, I was going to say it's a little bit like like a Pokemon tournament, but for models. But <laughs> I think I'm not going to say that for now on. All right. Um, so that's one way in which we can create better models. You, you know, we notice flaws of uh, current neural networks, and then we address those flaws. Um, here's another one. Uh, I think people really, really hate supervised learning uh, in terms of uh, as models of the brain. Now, why is that? Uh, I don't know the process by which I learned different categories like chairs and microphones and shahab and so on and so forth. But it probably wasn't because I was receiving uh, second by second feedback from my mom. You know, this is a chair, this is a chair, this is a chair, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a dog. Uh, that would have been very exhausting. And so people think that supervised learning is a very poor proxy for how the brain actually learns these kinds of categories. But uh, there are better ways. Over the past three years, people have looked, uh, have had a, a very strong interest in um, self-supervised learning. And so the idea here is, uh, let's say that I take a little movie of stuff happening in the world. I can, with very high probability, say that one frame of the movie and the frame after that of the movie, they contain the same things. So they should be kind of close together in manifold space. And if I wait, you know, 10 seconds or 30 seconds after that, uh, then they should be far away from each other. And so I can make inferences about what should be close and what should be uh, further away. Another way that I can do this is I can chop an image in two and I can say the stuff that you see on the left of this image corresponds to the same stuff that you see on the right of this image. Or maybe I can show two different crops of the same image and say, like, these things should correspond to the same. Uh, so these models have been getting better and better at um, at solving uh, things like uh, like ImageNet, and they're much more uh, because they're self supervised and they don't involve you know saying this is a cat, this is a cat, this is a cat. They're considered much more biologically plausible. Well, as it turns out, uh, these models are not only more biologically plausible, but they can account for uh, about as much variance as the best supervised models when it comes to alignment with uh, the brain, whether it's V1, V4, or area IT. So now we don't need to sacrifice this kind of biological plausibility to have a model that accounts for more variance. Uh, so I've been talking a lot about the, uh, the visual stream uh, or the visual cortex so far, because that's what I know. Uh, but you know, people have been looking at this uh, in terms of, of other brain areas as well. So uh, there's uh, an increasing amount of work on uh, language. So this is work from uh, Alex Hoof. Um, that showed that they can almost, they, they're very, very close to the noise ceiling in accounting for uh, responses of models when, um, when people are listening to stories with models which are uh, trained in a self-supervised manner um, to uh, predict uh, the next little chunks of, uh, of audio. And uh, they, re they also recapitulate the kinds of hierarchy that we expect to see in, uh, in the auditory cortex. Okay, so now I hope I to have convinced you that uh, people are trying to do this in the sensory cortex, but you might be like, well, there's not just the sensory cortex, there's all the good stuff, like all the multimodal areas in the brain and all the stuff that we don't know what it does. What about that? Well, it turns out people are doing that as well. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is the 10T paper. It's one of my favorite papers from, next, uh, from the last few years. Um, so they, uh, they essentially cast the problem of what is it that a hippocampus does as a uh, as the problem of uh, essentially when you're doing a little path to an area what is the thing that you're what are the landmarks that you're going to run into and so if you do that you can use a, a recurrent 
kind of architecture in order to do this. Uh, in this, this case, we use a, a transformer uh, with a causal attention match, uh, mask. And it turns out that you can take different parts of this model and relate them to biologically motivated models of the hippocampus, which are the Tolman Eichenbaum machine, the, 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 which is mixed with the transformer, which is why it's called TEM-T. And that model actually learns a lot of interesting stuff, including you know, some good old grid cells <laughs> and band cells. Uh, so I think that's really exciting and really interesting. Uh, you know, we have models that account for a lot of variants that are biologically plausible and that have high coverage. So if we keep going, you know, what does the future hold for us in, uh, in this field? So I think that we're moving towards a world where we can just download a pretty good model of a sensory cortex and potentially more. So uh, these are truly the days of miracle and wonder. And to illustrate that, I wanted to show you what the world looks like now if you're doing NLP. Um, so a few years ago, I mean, this was like essentially an impossible task. But now if I want to download a pretty good sentence transformer that can solve a bunch of problems like retrieval, like comparing semantically two different sentences, uh, like resolving citations, uh, like matching scientists to other scientists that have uh, similar kinds of interests, I can do that in five lines of, of Python. But if you look at what this network is actually trained on, uh, so this is uh, based off of MPNet, and this network is trained on 160 gigabytes of data, which is about 100 billion tokens. Uh, and it contains like most of the internet, uh, and you know, the internet is big. I, I don't know if you know about this, but uh, it is like remarkable that I mean, there's there's like years, like like hundreds of years of, of there's hundreds of person years which are embedded inside of this model, and it's uh, it's actually fine tuned on a billion uh, question answer pairs, which are found from uh, from different data sets. I can download this stuff with like five lines, and it's just you know it's it's easy peasy, and the models are just usable for a bunch of different purposes. It's not incredible. So <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, well, if I could download a brain right now, I, in exactly the same the same thing, wouldn't I want to do it? Uh, and how would I actually build this model? So I, I'll just give a, a plausibility argument here. Uh, I think that. You will want to train on some big multimodal task. Maybe it's some self-supervision task, or maybe you want to act within the world, like playing Minecraft or something in a big open world. Uh, you would want to use some biologically plausible backbone and then fine tune this pre-trained model on every brain data set under the sun. And I really do mean every data set. That means fMRI, MEG, ECOG, uh, EEG even if you really want to, uh, certainly behavioral data and, uh, and multi-unit activity data. And uh, you could align it to a standardized uh, human brain atlas. And it would be a pretty good proxy for uh, the kinds of processing that a brain does. OK, cool. So we've just downloaded the brain. Now what? Um, so uh, the, the second part of my talk is going to try and unpack this, uh, this question of like, what are we going to do when we can just download a brain like in the same way that you can download an LP model? So I'm starting with this uh, Leibniz model of of how the brain works. So Leibniz, pretty uh, pretty smart dude, um, invent co-invented calculus in addition to uh, uh, to doing you know natural philosophy way back in the day, uh, and he said that nothing is in the mind that was not first in the senses, except for the mind itself. So uh, what that means is that we imagine that the brain is some dynamical system that uh, essentially has its own successor states. So we take a certain brain state and we propagate it uh, towards the future. And the role of stimuli is to nudge the brain from one, uh, from its natural, uh, from, uh, for, from its, uh, its natural going from the first state to its successor state uh, so that it reaches a different brain state. And so what we're doing right now with these deep nets uh, is we're creating in silico versions of the successor function that are getting to be better and better approximations for, uh, for that, what's actually uh, going on. And so that's actually useful. So again, uh, the model of change, just to unpack that a little bit. So we're assuming that our mental state is some uh, high dimensional vector corresponding to a vector of neural activity at the relevant spatial and temporal scale, let's say columns at 10 Hertz. There are some 
desirable mental states, happiness, uh, excitement, uh, etc. There are certain undesirable mental states like being unhappy or waiting in line uh, or, or uh, just um, or being stressed. And a therapy essentially com uh, is composed of, of nudging us towards these desirable states through the presentation uh, of a stimulus through the senses. And these stimuli, because we have a proxy for what is the successor function of our brain, we can generate them by the optimization of a, an explicit function. And there's kind of an underlying little idea in there, um, which, that, which is that there exist stimuli in the world which are more powerful or somehow better controlled than the manifold of natural images itself to nudge your state of mind. And so I'm not going to give a full explanation for that, but I will give a plausibility argument. Um, so let's consider I'm trying to communicate the, uh, uh, the emotion of being stressed. Uh, so, you know, one way that I can communicate that is to send this, uh, this image. Uh, but if I'm clever and I'm, a, uh, and I'm a famous artist, like maybe I can communicate it through a few different brush strokes, like uh, Edward, Edward Munch did. And is uh, in his famous uh, uh, painting, the scream. So, with only a few uh, splotches of paint, he can communicate very effectively this notion, arguably more effectively than you could to presenting uh, the natural image itself. The natural image itself. So, I can probe uh, instead a artificial neural network to figure out what do you think are the images which are most aligned to this notion of stress. I can do that with uh, OpenAI's clip. And if I do that, this is what I get. Um, <coughs> so uh, I don't know about you, but this image is like really terrifying to me. I've looked at this image many different times. Uh, and it communicates this information of stress, I think, in a very effective manner. It kind of recapitulates the kinds of things that you see in Edward Munch's uh, uh, image. Like there's a lot of like curved. Uh, images, there's like this wide gaping mouth. And, and, and I think it's just very effective at nudging my, my brain state towards something. Now, you could argue that being stressed, like I'm already stressed enough, like I don't need to be nudged into a stress state. But you could argue that you could do exactly the same towards some happy state. And so we're going to see this process of uh, end to end of going from curiosity based research to actual applications now. Okay, so an end to end example. I love the dorsal stream. It's the best stream. Uh, it's uh, it's a stream of, uh, of uh, in the visual cortex, of course, that contains uh, uh, selectivity for motion. So uh, you have neurons inside of V1 that are selective for motion. Uh, in this case, uh, in this case, I actually don't know what the arrow of time is. So maybe it's selective to the left or to the right. Um, and these neurons are integrated in area MT to create, you know, the, the famous uh, uh, plaid selective uh, neurons which are insensitive to the exact pattern of motion that uh, creates these patterns. And then these cells are integrated in area MST, where you see cells which have these giant receptive fields that are selective for complex patterns of optic flow, like expansion, rotation, or wide field translation. So the question from a curiosity-based perspective is how do you bootstrap that selectivity into existence? And so we had a hunch, which is that these neurons are probably involved in navigation. So we train an artificial neural network, uh, that's uh, me and, and Shahab right here, uh, to uh, train a, to, to let this uh, artificial neural network back out what are the parameters of uh, motion are uh, from uh, a sequence of images. So we move a virtual observer in a virtual environment. We tell this observer back out what are the parameters of the motion are. And then we open up this black box to figure out what has it learned about the world. Well, what does it learn? Well, it turns out, first of all, it recapitulates the kinds of selectivity that we expect in V1, in MT, and MST. We can look at the hierarchical correspondence, and the, the hierarchical correspondence is, uh, is there. We can look at qualitative, like what does it actually prefer in terms of stimuli, and they're similar to what you would expect in V1, MT, and MST. And finally, we can look at, at quantitatively whether these, uh, this model like accounts for the responses in MT and MST, and it turns out it does better than any other model that we tried. So that's cool. So we went from this curiosity-based question, which is how do you bootstrap 
the dorsal stream into existence. And we have a pretty good hunch. You could use self-supervision on a heading estimation test. So I, as a baby, can decide I'm going to move forward to like get my toy. And that uh, corollary discharge or that efference copy can be used to bootstrap a uh, the, the kinds of transformations that we see in V1 to MT to MST, which is very cool. That tells us about why, uh, about how the motion selectivity might have evolved in the brain. But also, we have this, this engineering artifact, which is a best-in-class model of V1 to MT to MST. What are we going to do with that? So I argue that we can use that uh, to try to attack the problem of, of cortical blindness. So uh, there's a lot of people that suffer from stroke every year. And it is surprising and common. About 30% of cases, people end up with some visual problem. Uh, so typically, you'll have a stroke in the back of the head, in the primary visual cortex, and as a consequence, you'll lose up to a half of your vision in the opposite uh, hemifield. And so for these people, of course, they can't drive anymore. Uh, that would be dangerous. And uh, even like getting out of the house is, uh, you know, potentially treacherous. And so... Um, uh, and, and so uh, the, the question is, like, what we can, can we do for these people that number uh, 25,000 people in North America, in, uh, sorry, in Canada every year or a quarter million people in North America? Well, uh, one thing that, uh, that we know is that it's actually possible for these people to recover some visual consciousness in the lost part of their visual field. And that's done through psychophysics in the blind field. This is pretty wacky uh, <laughs> because normally we do psychophysics in places in the world where we can see stuff. Um, but here we're doing psychophysics in the blind field. And at first people can't do the task for obvious reasons because they're blind in that spot. Uh, but over a period of months, people can learn to associate these residual visual sensations that they have, which are automatic, uh, with like actual conscious perception. So it's truly remarkable. They go from, non from conscious to non-conscious and then back to conscious again through this process of rehabilitation. The problem is that this is not very practical because it takes forever for these people to do that. And it's very tedious and people drop out uh, midway. So what can we do here? Well, we know a lot about the system that, uh, that creates this, uh, that allows this to happen. So we know that when the primary visual cortex is lost, there's bypass pathways that go directly to extra striate uh, dorsal stream areas, including MT and MST. And that's what eventually allows this, uh, this perception uh, to occur. So uh, we also have a model for how we can recover visual perception here to visual perceptual learning. We can create mathematical equations for visual perceptual learning, and we can cast the problem of maximizing visual perceptual learning as an optimization problem. And guess what? We're missing one box, which is MT, MST, and that's the thing we just did in the last paper. So with that, we have all the pieces together and we can assemble them to create stimuli which are meant to maximally entrain visual cortex and to create the maximal amount of visual plasticity. And these are what these uh, stimuli look like. So these are artificial stimuli that are off of the image manifold, but that are meant to maximally entrain visual plasticity. And we're uh, in the process of, we hope to uh, start uh, early next year to test these uh, uh, these visual stimuli to see if they're actually better than state of the art at helping people recover visual consciousness when they've lost it. So I hope that you think this is very exciting because I certainly do. <laughs> okay, so uh, again, we started with uh, this curiosity-based research uh, problem uh, and we argued that, hey, maybe we could use this to create models which are useful for something. And I think that we demonstrated a path towards doing that. Sorry, I just uh, I just need to. Okay, I know what how much time that um, I have left. So I'm going to give you a couple of other examples because I think people are, are doing pretty exciting stuff in this field. Um, so here's a, a paper from uh, from Michael Baylor that just showcased this in the, in this year's Neurips. Uh, so they're looking at uh, people that have retinal implants. So retinal implants can allow you to see when you've lost the ability to see because of retin retinitis pigmentosa, and what you're thinking is like, okay, well, I'm just going to simulate to stimulate the right kinds of, of electrodes that will directly fire off the retinal ganglion cells. And it's like a little dot matrix display that I put on the eye. 
But further, but nothing could be further from the truth because it turns out biology is complicated. Uh, in fact, it's not like these nice little phosphines that you create on the uh, on the eye, but rather these elongated, you know, monstrous looking mon uh, phosphines. And the reason is that there's a bunch of uh, axons that are right over the retinal ganglion cells, and these are the ones that are being stimulated. And so rather than, than, than trying to create a, a kind of a dot matrix display, uh, we can try and inverse this process and figure out what the optimal patterns of retinal stimulation are. And so that's what uh, Michael Baylor and, uh, and Co. did in uh, this year's NeurIPS. And, uh, and they sh showcased that uh, you can, at least in silico, uh, try to, to do this and obtain pretty good reconstructions based off of an explicit model of uh, this transition from, uh, of, of uh, I should say, an explicit model of how the, the, the retina works. So I think this is a really, really exciting work and I can't wait to see it being implemented in the real world. Um, we can do that. Uh, we can do BCI. We can do. Uh, we can help people with uh, neurological uh, disorders, but we can also help people that have maybe more subtle uh, impairments in, in real life. So I'm particularly interested in the design of, uh, of accessible fonts uh, for people that might suffer from some reading disability. Um, so dyslexia is a deficit of phonological processing that leads people to have difficulties reading. Um, but it also has some visual components, right? Uh, in the sense that because uh, you don't get this uh, uh, this supervisory signal uh, during development, uh, you end up with weakened responses in the visual word form area. And uh, one characteristic thing of uh, people with, that have dyslexia is that they have more crowding than what's expected. So crowding is a phenomenon where if you try to read this letter while looking at this cross peripherally, uh, it's quite uh, straightforward. But if you try to read it while uh, you know there's extra letters uh, over there, it's uh, it's actually much harder because there's this phenomenon of of crowding. And the explanation is that the visual cortex creates a texture-like representation of um, of visual images in the in the periphery. And so people have demonstrated that people that have dyslexia because they don't uh, develop uh, to the same degree this specialized area for uh, for reading letters uh, actually have much more crowding than what's expected by a factor of about two. So um, as it turns out, the letters that we use uh, in everyday life, they're not created to be maximally discriminative from each other when we use texture-based representations. Uh, in fact, it's quite the opposite. You know, font designers just design their fonts so that they look nice. And it doesn't mean that they're particularly discriminable. You know, when they say like this font is meant to be readable, it just means like a guy looked at it and it's like, yeah, I like it. Um, so for instance, I, J, and L have pretty much the same kinds of features. So isn't it wacky that, you know, we design fonts, but based off of some just pure aesthetic criteria, like clearly, I mean, this is like an important enough problem that we should maybe use uh, like a better reasoning for, for why we, uh, we implement this. And so uh, what we can do is to learn the manifold of natural fonts by training a, a denoising diffusion probability model. So if you've heard of DALI or Midjourney or stable diffusion, you know what a DDPM is or at least how it's used. You can do that with fonts, right? You can do that with birds if you want um, and so on and so forth. So you can learn a serif font, uh, sorry, a sans serif font that is the most sans, sans serif fonts uh, using this uh, uh, this process. And then what you can do is to tell the network, actually, during creation, nudge the creation so that the letters are more discriminable, right? So that the representation similarity analysis looks more like a diagonal. And, uh, and again, it uses a model of what's happening inside of V2 and V4. And we have all of this stuff figured out through years of research into the ventral visual stream. And so I'm just going to go back so you can see the difference between one and the other. So it's pretty subtle, but let's look at this G over here. So the G is transformed so that's a double loop G, right? So this G is actually more discriminable from the T's and the, and the Q's in there. Let's look at the T here, right? So the T starts out straight, oh, and it gets nudged. It gets rotated right here. Uh, so it turns out that rotated letters, this is easier to discriminate against an L, for instance. Uh, let's look at this A over here. So, whoop, 
We change the height of the A so that it's more discriminable from other letters. So all of these letters have these like very subtle visual changes so that they're easier to see in the visual periphery. And so we're trying to, to, to test that right now to see if uh, either people are better at reading these letters in the visual periphery or it alleviates uh, some of the effects of, uh, of crowding that, uh, that they're used to. Cool. So preliminary conclusions. So we're creating these end-to-end -end differentiable models to satisfy our curiosity. And these models turn out to be useful to potentially create therapies. We're creating good models. You're going to create good models. Everybody's going to create good models. I'm, I'm not afraid of that uh, at all. But you know, there's other things that we might want, which are uh, having like really good delivery mechanisms and having good monitoring of what these stimuli do to the brain. So I have five minutes, so I'm going to power through this. Uh, <laughs> um, so delivery mechanisms, uh, ideally, OK, so you can present stimuli on a smartphone. You can present them on a screen. You can present them in headphones if it's an auditory stimuli. But like the very best kind of display would be some high resolution display that you have on your face 12 plus hours a day. And that has eye tracking and head tracking and that completely understands the world around you. That sounds like a pretty good, uh, like a pretty big laundry list of, uh, of things to do. But as it turns out, people are working on that problem right now. Um, uh, Meta spent, I think, $14 billion last year trying to build uh, uh, virtual and augmented reality uh, solutions. Uh, Apple is on this. There's just a tremendous uh, push in industry to bring about uh, devices that can deliver augmented reality. Um, so Michael Labrash, uh, who's the head of research at the Meta Reality Lab, said in 2017 that, you know, AR glasses could potentially enhance perception. Uh, they could enable him to see in low light uh, or they could help him live a normal life if macular degeneration hits him. These are really envisioned as devices that can deliver precisely the right pixels to precisely the right retinal ganglion cells in the real world. And I would argue that they would be particularly helpful for delivering uh, therapies that are envisioned through neuro AI. But there's a, even if we deliver just the right photons, the right retinal ganglion cells, we still have the problem that the brain is complicated and there's always some mismodeling, right? So we want to take measurements out of the brain to make sure that we've nudged the brain in exactly the right direction. And right now we're probably limited mostly to doing psychophysics or doing eye tracking in the real world. But what if we could take high bandwidth measurements out of the brain? then we could verify that we've nudged it in just the right way. So people are working on that too. Uh, so from a technological perspective, so these are uh, devices that I worked on when uh, I was at Meta, uh, a brain computer, like high bandwidth brain computer interfaces. And you might wonder, be wondering like, why exactly is Meta like trying to read brains? And the answer is, uh, again, augmented reality. So uh, the idea is that if you're going to have these glasses that you're going to wear around the world and that you're going to wear for 12 plus hours a day, you're going to want to interact with them. So do I want to be inside of a bus and just see, like yell out at, the, at, the, at my glasses like, hey, get me some toilet paper from Amazon? Maybe not. So I would want to be able to discreetly like talk to my device. And so the idea we have here is to build a silent speech interface where you could just talk silently to your device and it would just understand what is it precisely uh, that you're trying to infer. Uh, and this is not the only instance uh, while uh, I was there. Uh, also, uh, Meta acquired a, a, a startup in the DCI space, another startup in the DCI space for a reported uh, slightly more than a half billion dollars. Um, Snap is doing it. Apple is probably doing it too. So uh, people are really interested in solving this problem of input in the process of augmented reality. So I think that you know, if we think of ourselves as being parts of these different technological trends, uh, maybe you know the kinds of neuro AI that we're doing right now are missing like different kinds of technological components. But these are probably going to happen in the next few years through the release of consumer AR. And I'm not a mind reader here. I don't know exactly like when it's going to happen. But people speculate that it's going to happen in, uh, in the next few years. And then potentially um, high bandwidth consumer uh, brain computer interfaces. So I'm going to check my time here uh, to see how I'm doing. Oh, actually, I have a little bit of time. So I'm going to go over uh, by a little bit. Uh, 
so I think it's, it might be stressful for you to figure out like, where are you going to fit in this? You know, we just talk about chat GPT and, uh, you know, is our jobs like still going to exist in the future? So I'm an influencer. Uh, so I'm right here right now, but you know, I don't know, like maybe I'll be like a boson cutter in, uh, in the near future. It's just really hard to prepare yourself for, uh, for these things. Uh, but, uh, my, uh, my collaborator Conrad Cording really likes to say that, you know, you can be a world expert uh, in a field by just like taking two fields uh, that are like pretty far apart and just like learning a good amount, a good chunk about these two fields. And then in that intersection between the two, like you'll be the only person there. And so what I invite you to do is to be these kinds of intersectional people that just know about neuro and AI and programming and all of these things. I do think that there are some core disciplines that everybody should know, uh, math, uh, you know, math for machine learning, computational neuroscience, and uh, as well as software engineering practices. And um, so, you know, one of the uh, one of the things I did uh, over the past few years is, is help build up Neuromatch Academy. We've had, I think, over 6,000 students uh, go to our classes in computational neuroscience and also in uh, artificial intelligence uh, over the years from over 100 different countries, uh, people in in Iran and Palestine and the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Sudan. Uh, and I hope next year in North Korea. Um, and But also people that are, are at Harvard and Stanford and Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, so like really a uh, really saying that, you know, education should be free um, and free as in uh, speech. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if you want to learn more software engineering practices, I also have something for that. Uh, I have created the uh, Good Research Code Handbook on goodresearch.dev based off of my experiences and just being a software engineer at uh, Google and uh, what I've learned there. And uh, and you know, hopefully, I I make I'm planning on making a long version uh, thereof that should be released in bookstores in 2024. Uh, so just go to your local uh, library and see if it's there. All right. Um, so uh, that's all my time uh, for me. Uh, I uh, want to leave you with this, uh, this impression, which is, you know, the best way to predict the future is to build it. Uh, so go forth. Yeah.